shifting decision immediately. And when I say immediately, that means they can do this, they can make that decision in a matter of a few months, and they can actually breach these dams similar to the, in the way that I've got it displayed back behind me in this graphic, which is a Corps of Engineers graphic of a breach dam, and, and get on with this in a matter of months. So um, it's sort of a convoluted answer because there isn't one thing, but, it's, it, but what we have to do is explain to our politicians that we're fed up with studies, um, we don't want any more wasted, another $80 million wasted on more studies. We don't need more collaboration. We've already got that. We've got all the answers we need. We just need our elected officials to, to tell the Corps of Engineers and Bonneville Power Administration to do their job. And that's to save money and, and that will save salmon and save orcas. Oh, thanks, Jim, for that, um, for that answer. Um, I think you kind of, Tamela had a follow-up question, which is who profits from keeping them, which I think you went over um, in your answer. Um, and if I have that right, it's, it's kind of the people who are involved in the litigation um, that has gone on over the past decade is, are the ones who are profiting the most off of this issue um, because uh, I don't see the public uh, profiting at all if we are the ones paying for the operations and maintenance. Um, is that is that right? That's basically true. I mean, if you look at who's making money off of this, it's not the ratepayers, it's not the taxpayers. The federal agencies, well, they're getting their salaries paid. And I guess it's, it, it is the people that because of this ongoing uh, litigation and studies, it's those people that are actually making money that doesn't need to be made. Uh, they can be doing something else. So that, that's a pretty uh, correct observation. <clears throat> All right, um, so the next question we have um, is about the indigenous nations. This is from Keon. Um, can you tell us which indigenous nations a Snake River Dam is a part of? And then um, if you can add to that um, what Jesse's title and uh, native tribe he belongs to. Uh, well, let me start with Jesse Nightwalker. He um, he is um, um, he right. He is the current um, hereditary chief of the Palouse Indians. Now, the Palouse tribe was one of the two major tribes that uh, existed, lived right along on the Lower Snake River Valley, the Palouse and the Nez Perce. And now, other tribes, uh, because of all the agreements that they've worked on for hundreds of years. Uh, they shared the fishing rights in Lower Snake and the Columbia River. And so many tribes went to those areas and fished um, in collaboration with those more local tribes. But uh, the two tribes, I think, that, that were the closest right there to the Lower Snake Valley that occupied that area uh, generally were the Palouse and the Nez Perce. Okay. So. All right. Um, awesome. Okay, so we have um, a question here from Stephanie. Um, she wants to know, what's the difference between the four lower Snake River dams and the dams along the Columbia River? Are the other dams on the Columbia River not as detrimental as the Snake River dams? Uh, that's correct. They are not as detrimental um, the, um, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, the Snake River dams are 100 feet high. The typical Columbia River dam is 35 to 60 feet high. So they're, uh, they're easier, the Columbia dams are easier for adults to get up and they're not as lethal for um, juveniles going down. Um, the, the other thing you have to keep in mind is, is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's eight dams versus four. And it just so happens that the upper four dams, because of fish migrating up and going down, are going to be impacted just by the very nature that there's four dams up there, that four more they have to go through. Also, the, uh, the Snake River, because of its low flows and so forth, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a much sm it's a smaller river than the Columbia, so therefore it's, it's more susceptible, you know, it's, uh, the predation is greater, the reservoirs are more lethal, um, as you saw in the movie with the predators and so forth. So, you know, that, that's kind of, um, and also because of that high head, they have to, when they spill water on the spillway, that introduces a lot of dissolved gas into the water, into the reservoir. And that dissolved gas at a, above a certain level is lethal to, well, any fish uh, in, the, in the river, but especially the juvenile salmon. 
So um, that's one of, there's three or four several reasons why um, those dams are different. And I would also say there's economic reasons too. Um, for instance, the, the rail line, uh, the, the barging traffic on the lower snake is about 10% of what it is on the Columbia. So the Columbia is your main artery for inland waterway navigation, that's barging. Um, the Columbia also has two main railroads along, class one railroads, the Union Pacific and the Burlington Northern. And so, um, um, and, and the Snake has rail lines too. And so the, the point about the economics is, is that the uh, Columbia River dams are m much more important as economic drivers, whether you talk about hydropower, navigation, um, or irrigation. And, and so that's another difference. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, and yeah, you, you did touch on that, that um, the, uh, the lower dams on the Columbia are storage dams and the, the upper dams on the Snake are run of river dams. Um, and so I just want to add to what that means in terms of hydropower is that those storage dams can generate so much more hydropower because they have so much uh, more water that they're able to bring through those turbines than the Snake River Dam and the, the river up there is, is much smaller and there's no water that can be stored to then be released um, so that they have a much lower, um, you know, average megawatts that they're producing. Um, well, let me, um, I may have misstated that a little bit. The, the lower Columbia dams are run of river dams as well, although one of them does have some, a little bit of storage capacity. The real storage dams on the Columbia are the mid-Columbia dams, Grand Coulee, Chief Joseph, and those kind of dams. Um, uh, and, and what you said about those is, 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 is true. But so if I, if I said lower Columbia, those are also a run of river, but you're right. The Columbia River has a, such a greater volume of water that those, those dams, even though they're lower head, can put out a lot more power and they're just much bigger dams. And so that's their hydropower advantage over the lower snake, which has about maybe a quarter of the amount of water that's going through the Columbia. All right, awesome. So uh, we're gonna move on to the next question here. Um, this is from Rick Rupp. Um, he says, what has Kate Brown's message meant to the movement for dam breaching? Um, was it meant to influence Governor Inslee or support uh, representative, Idaho Representative Mike Simpson? Well, I, I don't, that, that's a good question, Rick. And, um, you know, I, I haven't had a chance to uh, meet with Governor Brown, even though I've asked her several times. So I don't know what her thinking was exactly. I, I guess I can interpret it this way, though, is that she, like other politicians and leaders, are, are beginning to realize that this, this, this status quo, let's study this thing argument is, is, uh, can't go on forever, and that salmon returns really are suffering. We've had, we're, we're now in a fifth straight year of really bad runs. The orca situation is, 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 not getting, is getting worse, and hydropower uh, benefits are dropping on the lower snake. So I think what she's at least recognizing, and it's better to start saying that you, you want to look at dam breaching, you may be for dam breaching. Um, what we're waiting for is her to pick up the phone and call up the Corps of Engineers and say, why don't you get on with this? You have the authority to do it. You don't need us. You don't need Congress. Um, it's, it's your call. You just, you just need to hear from us. And I should say that this is a message that I've heard over and over again from the Corps of Engineers when I meet with them as they say, hey, Jim, um, we don't disagree with what you're saying. It's just that no elected official or politician or even tribe or major environmental group have ever come in here and asked us to breach these dams since the late 1990s. What they ask for is more is litigation. They ask for more studies. They ask for more spill. That's more spill over the spillway as opposed to the turbines. And they've asked for different gadgets on different dams and, um, and more hardware, but they haven't asked us to breach these dams, so why should we? So that's what Governor Brown needs to do. And I, and I would hope that she's seeing the right handwriting on the wall here and maybe, you know, playing a little bit both sides against the middle or not the middle, uh, but just basically adopting a more neutral position on this, which is great. And I hope that Governor Inslee recognizes that that, that um, you know, he's got an ally down there, perhaps. I'm sure that if he was to support dam breaching, she would be right behind him. Awesome. Um, all right, so we have uh, another question here from Kian. Um, can Canadians push for dams to be breached? Um, how 
or to whom do we direct our focus? Um, and then I'm going to add to that question too, because we do have people here um, on the line who aren't from the Pacific Northwest. So how can those people also um, push for the dams to be breached? Okay, well, let me, um, if you're not in the United States, but, well, let's just pick Canada. Um, if you're in, particularly in the British Columbia, you, the lower snake dams are impacting your fisheries because these are what they call mixed stock fisheries when they go out in the ocean. These salmon from the snake get up into the Pacific. They mix with Canadian and Alaskan fisheries. And so when you drop down the runs, you begin to get in a situation where the, um, uh, particularly Alaska, but the Canadian uh, government can also do this, is that you, your, your runs are so low that you're impacting your local stock so badly that you're, you're basically decimating your own fishing, fish, fishery stocks because the Snake River stocks used to be the bulk of the system out there are no longer there. So it, it, for Canadians, you can, you can, you can petition um, uh, Governor Inslee, you know, just, you know, that go directly to him, um, or you can use this, the, the, the uh, State Department channels to pressure the State Department to do something here. Um, if you're a you know, U.S. citizen but not in the Northwest, I would go to whatever your elected official is you, in the U.S. Congress or you know, the Senate and employ them to talk about, you know, to put pressure on the Corps of Engineers. And again, we're not asking for legislation here. We're just asking that these government leaders, these senators and congressmen, wherever they are in the United States, to, um, to pick up the phone and put the pressure on the Corps, because that's how the Corps of Engineers operates. I was with them for 35 years. I know what they respond to. They respond to politicians, and the more the better, to, to say, we want you to do this, or I'm going to make your life difficult for you, Colonel or General, and, and they get it. So that's just part of the, how the process works. And so, um, and if you have questions, if you're a part of the country where you don't, you know, you want to ask who should, you should specifically go after, or if you know a politician, this is really important too. If you've got a relationship with a political leader here, like Governor Inslee or somebody in New York, Let's talk about it because we need to, there are, there are people in the U.S. Senate or Congress that can talk to Patty Murray over here or Senator Cantwell. And so there's, there's all kinds of relationships that can work here, but, you, but don't discount your, your, in, your potential influence just because you live in a different state or a different country. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, I, I really agree with that, that no matter where you are, we're all connected to this issue somehow, whether it's environmentally um, or economically. Um, and I'm gonna bring this up also for the people who aren't in the Pacific Northwest, um, is that your taxpayer money is right now paying for salmon recovery that is not breaching. Um, and that cost has been almost 20 billion over the past 20 years. Um, and so Bonneville is paying some of that um, but the federal government um, helps Bonneville Power uh, pay their fish and wildlife costs, which are for salmon mitigation. So if you are talking to your senators or writing a letter, you can say, I don't want my taxpayer money going to salmon recovery. Um, that's not working. Um, and that's not the right solution that needs to happen. Nina, I would also suggest one other thing for anybody in the world, frankly, if, if you, you, your favorite environmental organization that you belong to or give money to, read their websites and look very carefully what they're saying about salmon recovery and breaching these dams. And, and a lot of them will talk about dam breaching, but if they don't say it in black and white that they want to see these dams breached this year or, you know, this, you know, you term this year or 2020, then I, you should be suspicious. And, um, and any of these big donors that fund these, these, these non-government organizations that, that sort of have this vague notion about, yes, we believe that, you know, we want to see the dams breach. Well, what are you doing about it? Um, other than asking for more collaboration and more studies. And so that's another pressure point that, that frankly is, is gone untested here is to, is to ask our environmental organizations that we support and belong to, what is their real strategy? What is their real goal here? Is it, it's, is it to just go along with the flow or is it to stand up and be counted as somebody that's willing to um, um, work with the politicians and the elected officials and whatnot to uh, get the dams breached? 
Yeah, awesome. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I have a question here coming from Barbara um, and it's, it's um, what, like, what is the timeline that this needs to happen? How much time do we have left and how long will it take for a salmon to return once the dams are breached? That's an awesome question. Thank you. I think you can answer that. Okay, uh, good questions. There's a couple parts to it. So let me um, unpack it a little bit. The, the how long does it take to this process to get on with breaching? Um, well, it's been going on for 25 years. So let's discount all that for a minute. But here's the, here's the process, that, the way it can really work is like I said earlier, the Corps of Engineers can make a decision with Bonneville Power Administration because BPA will be paying the bills for breaching. And that's handy because you don't have to go to Congress to ask for the money. Um, and so, but, but that kind of decision process can be worked out in a matter of a few weeks. So then the next question is, well, how quickly can you breach these dams? And in the background, you can see what we do with breaching is that uh, the Corps of Engineers came up with a plan 20 years ago to basically remove the earthen berm from these dams. And that's over on the left side of your screen, if it's showing up right, where you can see the river going. Um, with the, the way it is now, there's an earthen berm there and the reservoirs behind that uh, dam. All the concrete stays there. So this is a lot easier. And if you're familiar with the Elwha Dam or Glines Canyon, this is a lot simpler than breaching those dams. And so the dam breaching process itself, once you begin drawdown in December, which you have to, it's, you really want to do it in December through March when there's very few fish in the river. And so um, that breaching process, drawing down the reservoir, notching the earthen berm and letting the water go through and washing the, 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 the embankment away takes about 60 days. We can breach two dams in this first year. And so, um, you know, that's, that's how quick the dam breaching. Now, how quick does salmon come back? Well, let's think about it. Where do you mean come back to? Because salmon are important in the entire life cycle um, from you know, the time they spawn to the time that they get out in the ocean and come back up. But let's look at it this way. The Snake River, um, about 20 million Chinook smolts, which are the smolt fish about this big, but they're about almost a year old, go through the Lower Snake Dam. And the mortality of each one of those dams and reservoirs, when you add them all up, is between 40 and 50 percent. And you can determine this by ba basically looking at NOAA data and Fish Passage Center data and, and so forth. So we know that we're killing roughly half those salmon, or maybe 8 million of them are dying because of the dams and reservoirs. So if you take the reservoirs and dams out, you save 8 million. Maybe half of those will die going through the rest of the dams and out through the estuary, but, uh, but several million of those are gonna be growing up into a 14, 15 pound salmon in about, oh, 18 months. Now that's, that's the quickest way that you can get salmon of an edible size out to a, a southern resident killer whale. It's also the fastest way to restore the uh, commercial tribal sport and subsistence fishing out in the Pacific and in the estuary areas around the uh, uh, coastal areas. Salmon coming back though, so all right, you've, you've now got a lot more coming back. It's not a, a few thousands or tens of thousands, it's hundreds of thousands to a million of returning adults that now would make their way back up into Idaho. So, and, and, it, and it's true now that salmon can get all the way back to Idaho. It's the fact that very few of the juveniles ever make it past all the dams. So very few adults come back. Without the dams, a lot more adults are gonna come back. So that introduces a lot more biomass into the Idaho area, which is part of the food chain for little ones. And so you, you begin to um, improve the life cycle up in the Idaho areas, the headwaters of the snake and so forth. Now, um, how long does it take those fish to come back? Anywhere from one to say five or six years. However, the, the larger fish that are five, six, four or five, six years old are basically gone now. So you'll see fish coming back, um, you know, one, two, one, two, three years, but you gotta remember every year a bunch goes out. So there's fish coming back each year. What you wanna see is the numbers go up and up and up and the biomass increasing and the whole life cycle restoring itself. And, and that, ha that can happen in a matter of a few years. But the longer you wait, the fewer those numbers are, the less chance you have of bringing those mass 
a massive fish back. And so that's what, the, you know, the, there was an element of timing. We are out of time. There's a lot of fisheries biologists that believe we may be too late on um, restoring wild Chinook. Uh, let's hope not. We believe we'll, let's keep going. Um, Southern resident killer whales, you heard the folks in the video, Ken Balcom and them, we're down to the very last bones here with a viable population, a reproducing population. So the, the urgency is absolutely on us now. So that's the one key thing. We don't have any more time really um, without taking enormous risk of complete failure of the, um, of the salmon and the, and the southern resident whales. We're also losing money on these dams every day, so the quicker the better, and I just explained the process of breaching can be done very quick, and we can save a lot of fish instantly by breaching. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, um, we've, I just want to add to that, we've, we've seen the salmon come back um, in those rivers that dams have been removed from, such as the Elwha, um, and so we do have hope that they will come back, um, but the urgent, that does not um, mean that we shouldn't be as urgently um, as we can pushing for this to happen because um, there's so much dependent on this, um, all the fisheries, um, the native tribes, and um, the taxpayers. Um, um, and I also want to add, um, just for clarification, um, for those salmon that are not killed with dam breaching is the ones that are released from the hatcheries that are way upstream of these dams. So those 20,000 fish are released, are, are mainly, uh, you know, mainly hatchery fish. So those are the, the fish that will 20 be- 20 million fish. 20 million? Yeah. Yeah, so the 20 million hatchery fish will have um, so much better chance of survival without these dams, and then they will come back um, one to three years later, um, hopefully full size. So um, awesome. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, let's see. Um, this is for Monica. She's wondering, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, so we might have to get back to you, Monica, but... Um, are there any studies that link Snake River Chinook, um, Columbia River Chinook declines to the decline of harvests in Alaska waters um, or the decline of other fisheries going up the coast? Yeah, there, there, are, there are certainly fisheries biologists, particularly in the ocean environment, that are looking at these, this interplay of, um, is, are there cause and effects? And for instance, um, the, the pink salmon in um, uh, Alaska are exploding in population. And one of, their, one of the effects of that is, is they're eating more of the uh, food out in the ocean. So that's having a negative impact on Chinook coming up from the south. Um, but I think one of the key points, though, is that um, the, the Pacific Northwest ecosystem, the backbone of that system is salmon. And the predominant source and strength of that backbone is the Columbia snake salmon runs. And they were the main force until you got up to Alaska um, of this system. And so when you take those out of the equation to the point that their, their numbers are so little, then all of a sudden um, Alaska fisheries and so forth are getting hit harder by any kind of predator um, and fisheries. And so, um, you know, there, there's that, that, that kind of ecological component to this thing. The other nuances going on there of cause and effect between different stock runs is very complicated. And, um, uh, and one of those things that would cost a fortune to study properly and would take dozens of years. And so we, we always like to remind ourselves, we do understand one thing. We do understand that these dams and the reservoirs behind them have a mortality rate of roughly 10 to 12 to 15 percent each. And when you do, when you look at that, that is the most important and quickest thing and most effective thing you can do. And since it's a policy option available to the government without going to Congress for legislation or going to Congress for appropriations, it's really simple. This is low hanging fruit, but the pro dam folks and the agencies have made it sound like it's impossible. A lot of environmental groups are talking about, wow, this is, a, this is, this is gonna take years of collaboration to make everybody happy. That's not true. 
all that's already been figured out. It's already in the previous studies. We know the price tag. We know who to write the checks through. We knew where to upgrade a rail line. All that stuff is already known. So um, um, that's the key point here is that um, we, we know the most critical things. Some of these ocean conditions are very hard to understand. And, and frankly, we could spend a lifetime studying them and still not have an answer. Well, on one hand, we do know what these dams and reservoirs are causing over here. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Jim, for answering all of our questions. Um, if anyone has questions that they think of after this is over tomorrow, when it's running through your head this next week, um, just feel free to uh, email info at damsense.org and we'll try and get your questions answered. Um, I'd also like to invite everyone to our next event. Um, and I just put the link in uh, the chat here. Um, and that's going to be an event for people who have already seen Dam to Extinction. Um, and it, the event is called um, Understanding Energy. So um, Jim is gonna help us um, really dive into the hydropower aspect of this and understand how hydropower is produced, how it's um, marketed, the costs involved, um, and then how losing the dams would affect the hydropower industry we have here. So um, go ahead and get your tickets for that. It's a free event and um, feel free to share. And we really hope to have more of these uh, screenings and this one seemed to work. All right. I hope everyone didn't have too much fuzziness on their screen. So uh, we hope to continue doing this and um, just encourage everyone to stay involved and stay connected during this uncertain time. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Jim, if you have any last words um, and then we are going to say goodbye. Bye. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Okay. Okay. Um, Diana is asking, I don't know if you're still here. Oh, she's not. She's asking if uh, this movie can, is available for purchase. Um, it's available on Vimeo, uh, which is a, a video um, platform. So um, and if you go on the website, damn2extinction.com, uh, they will have a link to view it um, on Vimeo. They also are selling awesome uh, Orca shirts and sweatshirts and things like that. All right, have a wonderful night, everybody. Bye-bye.